When you hear of World War II, it's often about panzers, spitfires, massive amphibious troop landings, aerial bombardments, the Holocaust, and the resistance. But what is seldom covered is the German anti-Nazi resistance. Believe it or not, but in 1940, there is such a thing, and it has some significant impact on the war. This is War Against Humanity, a subseries of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. During the next five episodes of this series, we will look at how Germany and Japan controlled the territories they were occupying in 1940, and how the population reacted by collaborating or resisting the enemy. We will start in Germany. Here, despite the Nazis' draconian control over everyday life, there are small pockets of resistance doing what they can to thwart Hitler's plans. They help victims of the regime, rally public support against the Nazi terror, or prepare for a post-Nazi Germany. Now, resistance to the Nazi government started as soon as the Nazis seized power in 1933. But as you can see in our Between Two Wars episode about the Nazi power grab, Hitler and his partners came well prepared against such resistance. This initial wave of attempted resistance was political in nature and mostly made up by left-wing political activists, journalists, and publishers. But to make a long story short, any active resistance was strangled in the cradle. The militant arm of the Nazi party, the SA and the SS, immediately proceeded to round up more or less anyone that just might pose an active political or violent threat to the regime. So during 1933 and 1934, political opponents from any party, socialists, communists, social democrats, leading Jewish Germans, intellectuals, and independent journalists were targeted with public bullying, discrimination, violence, incarceration in prisons or the first concentration camps, and not seldom murder. By the time the purge is done, any remaining political activists are forced into the underground or into exile. The ones remaining in the underground can't do much more than plot and try to support the families of those still incarcerated or murdered by the Nazis. In the following years, many of them will be rearrested, tortured, and murdered. Still, a few will slip through the Nazi net and eventually resume their insurgent activities. One of them is Harro Schulze Boysen. He is the great nephew of Gross Admiral Alfred von Tirpitz, the creator of the German high sea battle fleet, the basis of the Kriegsmarine. In his teen years, Schulze Boysen had briefly flirted with Nazism. By 1930, he was in his early 20s. He had now developed into an outspoken proponent of democratic principles, opposed both to the extreme left communists and the radical right Nazis, both who were seeking to overthrow the Weimar democracy. However, as 1932 came around, his political opinions became increasingly influenced by the far left. He started publishing the journal Gegner, or Opponent, focused mostly on anti-Nazi opposition. Around the magazine grew a circle of friends that will eventually become one of the most significant German anti-Nazi resistance groups. They are a colorful bunch with a wide variety of political and religious views. Conservatives, socialists, liberals, Jews, Catholics, and Protestants that only really have one thing in common. They oppose Nazism. That they make it through the 1933 and 1934 purges without arrest or even alive is mostly thanks to this colorful and often middle or upper class background. Schulze Boysen is not among the ones who avoids arrest. In April 1933, the Gegna publishing offices are thrashed by the SS, and Schulze Boysen is briefly imprisoned and tortured. While in the hands of the SS, he is forced to witness how they shoot at point-blank range one of his best friends, his comrade-in-arms, Henry Erlanger, who also happens to be Jewish. When he is released, his father has arranged a place at a military flight school. Clearly understanding that the choice is the army or death, he accepts. It's a bumpy road, though. He is now registered as politically unreliable. When, as a result, he hits a wall in his military career, he gets help from an unexpected direction. His request for promotion into a program for commissioned officers is stopped by the Gestapo. That doesn't go down well with the Luftwaffe, though. They resent being told what to do by the civilian secret police. But somehow, the head of the Luftwaffe and Nazi leader, Hermann Göring, hears 
about a relative of the venerable Tirpitz being pursued by the Gestapo and intercedes. Saying that it's time to let bygones be bygones, he puts Schulze Boysen on an accelerated path of promotion. This eventually makes him an officer in the strategic planning division of the Luftwaffe. Despite that he remains under massive surveillance, he doesn't give up on his resistance work, and he continuously slips through the net. He continues to meet with the Gegner Circle that now develops into a secret haven for anti-Nazi intellectuals in Berlin. They continue distributing clandestine anti-Nazi pamphlets, painting anti-Nazi graffiti, and so on. However, plans for sabotage and active resistance don't bear fruit. Instead, he turns to espionage, developing intense contacts with the Soviets. During the Spanish Civil War, he informs Moscow regularly about the Luftwaffe activities in Spain. Over the years, some of his co-conspirators are arrested, tried for espionage or treasonous behavior, and executed. Schulze Boysen is even taken in for questioning on a few occasions, but the Gestapo never manages to pin anything specific on him. In 1939, he gets to know Avid and Mildred Harnack, organizers of another intellectual anti-Nazi group in Berlin. Avid is a Marxian economist and lawyer who has infiltrated the NSDAP and works in high position with the Ministry of Finance. Mildred, his American wife, is a literary scholar and English teacher at a Berlin night school. Starting in 1935, Arvid is gathering military and political information for the Soviets. And through Mildred's close friendship with the U.S. ambassador to Germany's daughter, Martha Dodd, they start working for the U.S. in 1936. Already the next year, they inform the U.S. of the German plan to attack Poland. Between them, Schulze Boysen and the Harnacks are networked with several disparate resistance and espionage circles that now in 1940 count at least 150 operatives. As with the Gigna circle, they are groups of a wide variety of political, religious, and social backgrounds all of whom are now informing Moscow, Washington, Paris, and London regularly about the state of affairs in Germany. They are students, artists, journalists, and civil servants who discreetly but systematically work to resist the Nazi government. They do that in a wide variety of ways. Libertas Schulze Boysen, Haro's wife, for example, writes film reviews for the Essener Nationalzeitung. She uses this as a cover to collect photographs documenting National Socialist crimes that are stored in the German Cultural Film Center in the Reich Propaganda Ministerium. Through her connection at the American Embassy, Mildred Harnack obtains speeches by Roosevelt commenting on Hitler's policies that are forbidden in Germany. Dictatorship, however, involves costs which the American people will never pay. The cost of the blessed right of being able to say what we please. The cost of freedom of religion. The cost of being cast into a concentration camp. The cost of being afraid to walk down the street with the wrong neighbor. The cost of having our children brought up not as free and dignified human beings, but as pawns molded and enslaved by a machine. She uses the network of groups to keep the resistance movement informed of the outside world by passing on these speeches and other foreign information. Now, all of that might sound a bit puny in the world at war, but we should remind ourselves of the impact it has. Without these efforts, people outside Germany would be virtually blind to what the regime is doing. Without them, Germans ready to resist would have no idea of what is going on outside of Germany. So, in essence, what they are doing both influences the foreign policy towards Nazi Germany and keeps this vital flow of information alive. And it is now, in 1940, that this will be vital as a change happens in the Wehrmacht. Until May 1940, Hitler had a lot of opponents in the Wehrmacht. While a few high-ranking officers were in fact opposed to Nazism itself, the majority of opposition came from a distrust of the Führer, resentment of his direct personal meddling in army affairs, and the view that Hitler was an incompetent military hack. You might even remember from our weekly episodes how Franz Halder, the chief of general staff of the German high command, the OKH, plotted a coup only a year ago. In November 1940, all such ideas are off the table. Despite the failures in the Battle of Britain, the OKH is still proudly basking in the spotlight of the surprising success in France to make sure that no one steps out of line again 
Hitler has made them feel that this success is a very personal thing. He achieves this by bribery through promotion and outrageous wage hikes. Halda himself has been promoted from General to General Oberst, Colonel General. His pay is now double that of a regulated level for that rank. And he's not the only one at the top that receives such special treatment. The only opposition is now from those ideologically or politically convinced that Hitler must go. And that is a much, much smaller group. This shard of resistance is largely coordinated by Hans Osta, Generalmajor in the Abwehr, the military intelligence service. He has been an active and essential member of the German resistance since 1934. According to his own notes, his opposition develops into hot, fuming hatred of Nazism during the pogroms of the Reichskristallnacht in November 1938. Now, as you have seen in our weekly episodes, Osta himself is actively spying for the Allies. He is protected by his boss, the head of the Abwehr, Admiral Wilhelm Canares, who sympathizes with him. Canares also works against Hitler by sabotaging his foreign policy and passing on erroneous or incomplete information. Thing is, Osta wants to do more, much more, but after the success in France, he faces a familiar problem, Hitler's popularity. Now, we've talked about the heavy oppression keeping German resistance in check, and it would be easy to believe that Germans just cowered under that and simply didn't dare to oppose the Nazis. That would be false. There were rare cases in the 30s when Germans protested against the Nazis en masse, like when Catholics rose up in protest against removing crucifixes from Oldenburg schools in 1936. When faced with massive public dissatisfaction like that, the Nazis simply backed down. So the simple truth is, there just wasn't much of a will to resist. Most Germans either supported the Nazis or were indifferently satisfied. Osta recognized this, and instead of trying to build a broad resistance movement, he focused his efforts on change from the top. In other words, remove Hitler, preferably by killing him. In fact, Oster was the mastermind of one of the several thwarted or abandoned assassination attempts against Hitler in 1938. He was also the instigator behind the abandoned Halder coup. And the only reason that coup was even a topic of discussion was Hitler's dwindling popularity after the invasion of Poland, which really did shock the Germans and had less support from the regular Wehrmacht leadership than you might think. But now, in the autumn of 1940, with Hitler and new heights of popularity, Oster is left with little opportunity for action. Though he hasn't given up. Neither have Harro Schulze Boysen and Arvid Harnack. They meet in October 1940 and decide that they will from now on work actively together to form a more organized, stronger German civilian resistance movement. So there we have it. In 1940, the Nazis still have Germany in a firm grip. Resistant movements are left to petty vandalism at peril to their lives. The leader of both the civilian and military resistance are powerless for lack of support and concentrate mainly on espionage. But that isn't just nothing. As Hitler and his generals plan for a great battle in the East, these men and women, already risking their lives, will play an integral part in the war. They will continue to resist Nazis, spying on them and exposing their secrets. They will do their best to sabotage Hitler's efforts to oppress, murder, and conquer. Many of them, almost all of them, will pay the ultimate price and die for their cause. To see how the Nazis took control of Germany and gaslighted the Germans so that the whole country became more or less Nazi, check out our Between Two Wars episode about how the Nazis consolidated their power on the Time Ghost channel right here, any moment now. Our patron for this episode is Andreas Ogur Hansen. Thanks to his membership in the Time Ghost Army, we can continue expanding our coverage of the war like this. If you haven't already, join our forces on Patreon or TimeGhost.tv. The war effort needs you. Don't forget to subscribe to Time Ghost and World War II and press that bell. (laughs) 